Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and Dubai Watch Week 2021. I'm here with Edward Melan, CEO of H. Moser & C. We're talking watches. Edward, welcome. Thank you. This is very formal because Dubai Watch Week is a very formal place and you're formally introducing some new pieces. So uh, let me know what's on the agenda for Watch Week. Actually, we're not launching many new pieces. We're just launching one small capsule edition. Um, quite unconventional for Moser, uh, using bronze. As you know, we haven't done many bronze officially at Moser. I think it's the first official launch of a bronze case for Moser. And uh, to make it even more special, we use our Kyrillic logo, which we only use twice in our history. So we did something in 2017, and now it's the second time. 50 pieces limited edition in the Heritage, um, I'm wearing it here, uh, case. As you remember, Heritage is the collection where we play a little bit with the historical products from, from Moser. So we go into our museum, we look at what we have in there. We have amazing things. A lot of people don't know about that. We're very, very bad about talking about our history. So the best way to do that is to create a product. So we'll circle back around to the museum because I think a lot of folks don't know too much about that. Let's talk about the last Heritage launch. Uh, just a few months ago, really, yeah. you launched the Heritage Dual Time, which was a different take on the Heritage, two time zones, a fascinating combination of color and character and really a modern take on the Heritage case, which I guess is inspired vaguely by vintage pilot watch styles, but this was not that. Can we talk a bit about how that's been received? Well, the Heritage Collection, to be honest, is, um, has been received extremely well. I think the, the tension we created between this Heritage, these antique watches, but bringing this modern touch through the color of the dial, you know, here you have the Burgundy Fumé, but we did the funky blue before. We have the Globalite numerals, so it's really like three-dimensional ceramic charged with Superluminova. It's vintage, it's kind of even an antique. It has like traditional watchmaking finishing, but it's modern, and that's what we like at Moser, and that's why people love this collection. And yes, it has a little bit of a pilot vibe, but I think those kind of watches were not only worn by pilots, so we don't really use that, that name for it. Uh, that, mean, some other brands love to do that. You could almost consider it to be a little bit of an officer's watch style, and kind of in that vein, why don't we circle around and talk about the museum, because a lot of folks realize Moser's a very old name, but a young company. Yeah. Uh, what do you do to sort of curate the history of Moser's past? Well, not enough, but we have a, a great foundation um, that is run by the family Moser that I'm part of, and we, we sponsor it as a brand, and we try really to keep the two separated, but uh, I'm sitting at the board, and uh, we kind of sponsor them so that we, they, can, they can run. It's all about the history of the Moser family, and not only about watches. So if you come and visit our museum, there's five rooms. Um, one is about the life of Heinrich Moser, one is about this watchmaking era, one is about this um, entrepreneurial spirit when he, you know, he created the first hydromechanical dam on the Rhine River. He established a lot of companies in, um, in Schaffhausen, including IWC, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, and then there's this story about the, the rest of the family, his son, and we're working on a, on a beautiful room for, for the ladies uh, of the Moser family who, who did also extremely important things for, for Switzerland. The region of Schaffhausen was one of the poorest regions in, in Switzerland, but thanks to the Mosers, it became um, what it is today. And so the museum is open to the public? or On invitation only. I mean, if, if you come and you ask us, we'll, uh, we'll open it. We have a curator, she's always there. Um, and it's, uh, it's a nice place. I mean, it's, um, it's in the original castle of Heinrich Moser, so it's this 150 year, years old, beautiful mansion overlooking um, Schaffhausen. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing asset for us to, uh, to express what the history of the brand is, but we're not so good at expressing it, uh, to be honest. I think you're doing all right, but let's expand this thought. If people want to make a weekend of it or a week of it and have the Schaffhausen experience, are they able to visit the museum on appointment and get a tour of the Moser factory? Yeah. Yeah, we, we organized that. I mean, to be honest, recently since the, I mean, the, the, there's a little bit less of a lockdown. I don't know how it's going to last, how long that's going to last. But uh, right now we have pretty much every day groups coming and visiting. Uh, we have also the largest waterfalls in Europe. I mean, nothing compared to the Niagara uh, Falls, but it's, uh, it's pretty big. It's pretty cool. There's castles around it. So people come and in a, in a, you can come for a day. It's 30 minutes from the Zurich airport. And you can see the waterfalls, you can see our museum, you can have a great visit of the old town of Schaffhausen and discover the Moser collection in the manufacturer where we produce hairsprings, which is also quite unique. I mean, we have a lot of people who have visited tons of manufacturers and they come and like, oh my God, that's the first time I see this. And we're very open about it. We like to show what we actually do. And 
there's no secret, you can take pictures and a lot of people come out and, be, and they're pretty excited about it. Now a lot of folks know about precision engineering, but it sounds to me like some of what I associated with your subsidiary precision is actually inside the Moser factory. Are they one company together or are they separate locations? No, it's all under one roof. That's what, what's very cool. I think it's quite unique in the industry is that you have everything under one roof. Some are maybe more integrated than us, but it's in different sites. For us, you know, we do everything in the movement, including like the small gold screws uh, for the escapement and the hairspring, and that's all under one roof. So you go and the process is we show you how we develop with the engineers the movements and the escapements. Then we go and see like how do you pull the, the wire to get to this uh, the right uh, dimension? How do you you clean it? You make it flat? Then you you, you create um, the, the the hairspring itself. Uh, you have the hoven and all those things. So it's a pretty pretty interesting tour. So of course Moser making still about fifteen hundred watches a year. Yeah, but two hundred thousand hairsprings though. Yeah. So again, if you do the math, you realize Moser is a pretty significant supplier of hairsprings and escapement components, and they're making all those small parts: the solid gold escapements, the hairsprings. If you remember the collaboration with MBNF, the cylindrical hairsprings. Started with the hairspring, yeah. Yeah. So they are one of MBNF's friends. You'll see them listed, but. Uh, speaking of friends, what's the collector response like during the pandemic? How do you make the rounds and promote the brands when it's challenging to travel and it's hard to gather people together? Well, you turn digital. I think uh, we were quite digital as a brand before. We were always very engaged with our consumer, uh, consumer uh, customers and, and owners and our community. And um, that worked well for us. I think um, launching the collaboration brought new people to us uh, and to MBNF. We engage them. We have a great young team, very, um, very savvy, tech savvy uh, on Instagram, answering the, the emails and, and messages very quickly. I try to do it myself as much as possible uh, when I can, and I think that that's something people appreciate. And I think because we only produce 1,500, it's still manageable. I understand for bigger brands, it might be more difficult. Fact: This man is active on social media. I will also add this. You've had a lot of product coming and going recently, kind of winding down the Ventura collection, um, creating a new collection with the Streamliners. And I'm just curious, how does product playing take place at the upper level? Like, when do you decide, you know, we're going to have a new line, we're going to subtract an old line, we're going to have a new model within an existing line? How does that process start, and then how does it progress? We're probably very pragmatic people at Moser, and it's really guts feeling. It's not many people. It's my brother, myself, uh, Nicholas, head of sales, and Maurizio, head of uh, production. And we just sit down and say, you know, what do we want to do? What do we like? What's missing? What do we think? At some point, it's at the moment, it's been we, we stopped the Swiss uh, the Swiss Alp watch and the Venture because six collections for such a small brand is just too much. We felt the Venture was too close to the Endeavor, and the Endeavor allows us to be to highlight the beauty of our, our movements better um, because it's a flatter uh, sapphire and uh, creates l less reflections. And the Swiss Alp watch, we just didn't have any movements anymore, so we, we stopped it. So, yeah, I think we, we try to think, you know, what, what, what do we like? How can we innovate with new movements, which take a lot of time? How can we bring new materials? How can we bring something that is a, a different color, that makes it sexy, that is, com um, uh, I would say, considered as, as something very interesting and new in our offering? But we don't do market research. We don't, you know, go too much into that. There's no focus groups. No focus groups. I think we are the focus groups. We create watches we want to buy ourselves. <laughs> That's fair. Well, you're, you're batting pretty close to a thousand lately. The last year has been the year of the streamliner. From yeah. The original launch of the flyback back in early 2020. Then we got different color variants of the flyback. Then we got the center second. Now we've got a perpetual calendar. What's the response been to that watch? Because, to me, it's almost as though the watch was there and gone in, in 60 seconds. I mean, it's just a hard watch to find on the market these days. I think it's a lot of different factors that make this watch like difficult to, to get. It's just we didn't anticipate such a demand. Um, you know, when you produce 1,500 watches, you plan for 1,500 watches. And if the demand doubles in a year, then the things we don't produce ourselves take about eight months to, um, to get delivered. And again, we want to protect the brand. We want to make sure that you know, we do high quality products. And you cannot double your capacity from one day to the other. And, and, then, and I think that's the reason why people are, are now saying, you know, this, this, this watch is difficult to get. It's just, it's not because we produce less than the rest. It's just that there's too much demand for it. There has been a tremendous groundswell of demand for watches in this style, but what I always found fascinating is that the Streamliner doesn't look like a Gerald Genta watch. Everyone else says, oh, integrated bracelet, steel, it's got to be... It's got to be like the Nautilus, or it's got to be like the Royal Oak or the Jumbo Engineer. Your watch looks almost more organic than mechanical. How did that come about? Because it really doesn't look like a typical Genta design. 
<laughs> it's probably the reaction of, you know, my father has been working for uh, AP many years, so I, I grew up with the, the Royal Oak, which was like the ultimate um, Genta watch for me. And then uh, we are based in Schaffhausen. IWC is very close by, they have the engineer. So for me, it was important, if you want to emancipate as a brand, to create something new, something different. I couldn't create something that would look like the Royal Oak that I grew up with because you know, it would be like, oh yeah, obviously, you know, he did, he did it because, or the engineer because half of my team has worked for IWC before. So we needed to push the boundaries and, and Moser has, um, I think, prevailed and, and grown in the recent years because we were different. Because we were pushing our boundaries, we were taking risks and doing things differently. And when that was the most ambitious project that we had, we worked many years on, on this. For me, it was very important to do something that if we do something like that, then let's go all in and take the risk of doing something that maybe most of the people won't like. But at least it's very different from what the others offer, because that's the only way for an independent brand to, to go out there and, and survive. And I think on the long term, today there's definitely a large demand for integrated steel bracelet. And I would say pretty much any brand can sell something, even if it looks, I mean, I see certain, certain products and I'm like, like, this could look like any other watch brand. But they're selling because there's nothing else out there. Um, I believe and I hope that the streamliner is different enough that when we look back in 10, 20, when it's going to be a completely different market, we say, well, that was the watch of the 2020s and maybe beyond that. That's our ambition. It's very pretentious. No, <laughs> no. But, uh, but that's the way you create something like this, hoping that one day we can recognize it as a potential icon. Well, I mean, it's great to have goals and it seems like you're well on your way. I, I do wonder, though, because a lot of folks always ask me about the stylists of watches. You know Gerald Genta after the fact. It wasn't known in the 70s, wasn't widely known at the time what he was drawing. You know, obviously the copyrights were issued in the name of the manufacturer. But do you have design folks in-house who work on Moser designs, like people whose names you disclose, like as, as the designers of your watches? Well, we disclosed on the, <coughs> on the Streamliner, his name was uh, Marcus Eilinger. He's external. Uh, he worked for IWC for many years and then became um, independent and he designed the Endeavor. So uh, when I started, I knew many other designers uh, and I tried, but we went back to him and he designed most of our things. But we do, it's really, it's really a, a teamwork. So the way we work is we come up with ideas and you know, uh, throw ideas to people who can draw. And for example, here, um, a lot of people refer to, um, to Porsche design for the bracelet. Um, to be honest, the, I, I like the IKEPOD um, sing, single link bracelets, um, and that was the source of inspiration. And then we talked with Marcus and then said, you know, how do we do it Moser? Moser style is very organic, uh, minimalistic, and, and then it's a discussion. You try things, you design, and I mean, I can have ideas, but I have no capabilities to, um, to, to draw it. And then it's his responsibility to put it in a into shape and then it's very democratic. We have, as I said, a few other people working with me and then we'll discuss. If it's 50-50, then I tend to be the one deciding, but most of the time it's not 50-50. I think we, we slowly manage to build a team that understands each other, has the same kind of taste, not always, which is good as well, but I think um, that helps really take the right decisions. Now that you do have two sports watch lines between the Pioneer and the Streamliner, yeah. and you're offering some of the standard dress watches like the Endeavor in base metals like steel, uh, it seems that the company's taken a much more sporty tack just in the last couple of years, away from its original roots in pure Very dress watches and precious metals. Uh, is this a decision that was made, or is it something that's been more customer driven? Uh, I think, you know, we all in our 40s, very active, and um, when I started at Moser, I was a little bit, um, um, I would say, um, disappointed sometimes on weekends not to be able to wear my Platinum Perpetual Calendar because the first time I, I did, I scratched it badly, and the face of the watchmakers, you know, told me, like, it shouldn't happen that often, even if I'm the owner. So I, I, it was important for me to have something that you, you could be wearing every day, and I think, so in a way, it was self for ourselves, but of course the market was moving, shifting towards more the, the sporty dressy watch. And why do we have two collections? And I think the Streamliner and the Pioneer are very different. But I think for the future it's important that they, they, they grow uh, with their own identities. We might have a family of movements for both, which will be a little bit more sporty. You've seen it on the Perpetual. This is going to be the new codes for all our future Streamliners and, Perpet and uh, Pioneer movements. And we will keep the more traditional for the heritage and the endeavor. But we have a lot of things we're working on on the Endeavor and the heritage for the future. I think it's important to continue for Moser with that strong, classic, elegant identity, which works so well. I mean, our concept, minimalistic dials, 
amazing. And we, for me, it's important to, to go even further. We see now tons of brands doing the Fumé that Mosa dial. Um, even here at, at Dubai Watch Week, every day we see, uh, we see new ones. And some people are like, oh, asking me, you know, are you not upset to see this independent brand or that big brand doing a, a Mosa dial? I said, you know, we didn't create them. We rejuvenated, we brought new colors, and, and the success of Moser obviously inspires others, and that, that's fair enough. It pushes us to, to go further, so we're exploring new materials and, and try to bring even more um, intrinsic value in, in those dials for the future, and you will see some interesting things in 2022. Very exciting. So I have to just admit to the audience that my favorite Moser is still the Endeavor Perpetual. It's a dress watch. It's mostly made in precious metals. It's still my favorite. I feel like it's the heart and soul of the brand. Uh, do you have a personal favorite model or variant in the lineup? To be honest, the Perpetual, um, yeah, the Perpetual One historically was the name of the, the watch, but the Endeavor Perpetual Calendar Funky Blue was for me the watch that I would say if I had to pick, I mean, there's tons of them that I really love, but I think that was the moment where I realized what I wanted to do with the brand. That was probably 12 months into the being uh, the helm. What was interesting, it was the same watch that had been sold before, but by bring, bringing this fumé, funky uh, color and the kudu band suddenly, something that was very elegant and traditional, but a little bit dusty, like you know, my grandfather would wear it, became like a modern watch. And, and that's where I realized that that's why Moser is there. I think we need, we're an independent small brand, but we cannot do what MBNF or Verk or the Betune do. We need to do something that is, that is us and that's playing on this 1828 heritage, but staying modern. And, um, and that's where everything became more easy. And certainly, the colors you've used and the fades that you've used on the Fumé dials have become a signature of Moser, widely copied in the industry, and something that people almost expect now across the model lines, even on dress watches. Could you walk me through how those dials are made? It must be a galvanic process, but how long does it take? How many steps are there? It seems like something that would be rather complicated. Yeah, we, well, so we say there's about 200 steps if you consider every, if, if you put the indexes and facets and everything, but the main um, the main, and I'm, I'm, we, can, we can send you a movie to illustrate it, but the main, um, I would say, uh, elements is really the preparation of the, of the brass uh, dial, creating the, the sunburst, which is basically the dial is rotating and you have a brush that is vertical, it's turning and the other one is turning like this and then you create the sunburst uh, effect. Then you have a, a galvanic bass to create the, the base color, blue, red, green, whatever. Uh, and then there's another rotation if, uh, element on the machine, which is the secret machine that is not so secret anymore, which is our Fumé uh, effect. So basically you, the dial is rotating and you spray on a certain angle um, and at a certain speed, um, uh, a darker color or a wider color, depends what, what effect you want to have. And then the, 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 um, the paint just uh, drifts on the side and creates this gradient and then you have the zaponage and then depends what kind of logo you want to put or the indexes and then yeah it's a uh, it's a pretty long process and uh, you know anything happening in the middle would make it a defect dial you know a small dust a small um, but it's fun sometimes to have def defect dials so usually when they you know they screw it up with the color that's when we create our special editions and we had many cases where they're like oh no it didn't come out as expected i'm like oh well, well, don't throw it away just give it to us and we'll find something to do with it and that's how we came up with the arctic blue we had some purple colors that came out that was just not what we wanted but that makes those small collections pretty sexy yeah it's just it's like a defect on a stamp it's more collectible not less collectible yeah exactly it. exactly so now speaking of weirdness and all kind of an offbeat sensibility. It seems that the era of the big watch trade shows is over. I don't know if we'll ever have another traditional SIHH or SEHH for all my French language viewers, I know. Well, it seems like it. it seems like well, for next year, we may or we may not, but are you gonna ever find a way to continue the concept watch series? Because you've had watches made of cheese, watches made of garden material. You've had a watch that, well, was made of a lot of familiar <laughs> signature designs and uh, probably Icon's the most watch. popular is was Icons. Well, popular among collectors, not popular among watch brands. I, I get more managers. questions about that watch than any other watch that basically doesn't exist. But there is one, it does exist, but this one exists. and there will be more, but how are you going to release them to the world without a... That's a, a good question. Show? I mean, we're asking ourselves, uh, first we need to find the right topics, and we have some ideas, um, but it was always fun to do that in the middle of a fair where, you know, people come and want to see the extraordinary and if you see just the standard collection and may, sometimes you don't even have access to the standard collections that's kind of boring so that's why we always try that Moser to bring those things 
So without fairs, I don't know. I mean, the digital world can help to some extent, but it's, you still need a platform. And maybe then it's a traveling uh, exhibition. We're bigger, we have more resources. That could be a, a way to do it. Or use platforms like Dubai Watch Week and then uh, to release something and then, and then see where, where it takes us from there. But yeah, that's something we would miss because it was a lot of fun to, uh, you know, to create a little bit of controversy at the beginning of those big fairs, sometimes too much controversy, but, um, but it was always uh, fun to be kind of the center of attraction when, uh, when, you, when you're a small brand uh, under the radar and suddenly like, why is everybody talking about Moser? Whereas you have all those huge brands with huge budgets and we just drop one watch and everybody's like, oh, you have to go and see it. Did anyone ever try to buy those watches? Oh yeah, I mean the the Swiss Icon watch. I got offered over a million U.S. dollars for the for the watch. Now it's a big fight between my brother and I on who owns it. I said, you know, I lost probably ten years of my life because of the stress that it generated, so it's mine. But <laughs> if you ask him, it's his. Speaking of stress, I think the most stressful part of watch ownership is service. What is Moser doing to kind of buck the trend of the independence you know area, which is generally great products? but obtuse and slow service. Yeah. I think it's kind of like a double-edged sword. You get a great watch, but often it's difficult to go into service. What are you doing to make that less painful? Well, there's two aspects. First is people. So we have we have a service center at the HQ with three people uh, constantly. We're hiring more people. We had a, um, somebody leave, left recently, which was running uh, that department for many years. Unfortunately, had to go back to Namibia, where his family was from. So we had to find it, it's very difficult. So we had a little bit of delay recently, but um, so we have a very good team there. And then the new guy who is coming has a lot of experience. So it's gonna, it's gonna really help. And it goes beyond after sales service. It's really consumer relationship uh, for, for us. Uh, but we have also um, service centers pretty much all over the world. We have uh, Alkis in New York, who is uh, an amazing uh, gentleman, who is probably one of the best outside the, the manufacturer to, manuf to uh, service Moser. Um, we have a service center in, in Hong Kong, in, in Tokyo, in Dubai, here with the Sediki, where we train the, the people. We have in Italy as well, uh, in China as well. Um, and we want to continue to, uh, to expand that. In parallel, we work on the products to simplify servicing. Um, one of the elements you know well is our modular escapement. And the modular escapement, usually in the watch, the most important element is where time is created, is the escapement. And we created this module, so it's really plug and play. And in a, in a way, any watchmakers can, uh, that's the basic training at Moser, you, tr you train to replace the escapement with a new one, or if the customer wants uh, uh, to keep the same one, we can you know, clean it and, and put it, but it's, it simplifies a lot the, the after sales service uh, of, of Moser, and we try to be, you know, as we grow, um, not in volume, but in, in, in the structure, we're trying to be better in the way we um, industrialize a little bit of the process so that we get faster. I think at the moment we definitely are on the on the on the right side. Edward, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much.